Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Pacer ETFs. Beef up your portfolio with Cow G. Yeah, that's right. That that it was, it was so bad. I almost had to. Res- I have to respect it. I gotta gotta you know beef it up, <laughs> beef up. Cow G. <laughs> Uh, okay, what, what is, is Cow the- It's It's the Pacer U.S. large cap cash cows growth leader. This strategy aims to identify top growth companies in the Russell 1000 by screening for above average free cash flow margins. All right, Ben, if you had to guess, what do you think, what sector do you think has the most free cash flow? Like, what do you think is the biggest sector in this, in this strategy? Got to be tech, right? Boom, nailed it. It is tech, 46%. But what's interesting is that I'm looking at the top 10 holdings and I don't see any, none of the fan mag names. So it's not just another like uh, mega cap tech strategy. So free cash flow, it's important. So uh, if you want to learn more about beefy up your portfolio, can't believe I just said that again. It writes itself. Visit paceretfs.com for more. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. I, uh, I went into my closet yesterday to look for a button-up shirt. Is it button-up or button-down? Are they synonymous? Go on, can go down. both ways. Button-down. I've heard it. I've heard it say. I've heard it. I think it's as because you start from the top. Does it? Does anyone ever start with a bottom button when they're buttoning their shirt? No, you start from the top. Yeah, that's true. All right, button-down. There you go. Uh, I've got a. I've got a meeting today that I needed to be dressed for, and I went to my closet and I said, "Hey, wait a minute. I had not. I had." None of these. Not that I have so many, but I couldn't find anything. I'm like, wait. Oh, that's right. I, I think I went to the laundromat uh, and, and dropped a shirt off a couple of, couple of months ago. So I went to the laundromat and gave them my phone number, and they said, don't have anything. I said, yeah. It was, you know, it was a couple of months ago. And uh, I was like, is there like an old pile or something? So she goes, hold on. Let me check. Like so lost and found? She, so she brings, she brings back my stuff. And these are the dates of the drop off. I've got one from December, 2022. That's not even that long ago. F- five months for dry. Cl- yes, it is. You left your dry. Cleaning oh, yeah? for Five months. I got one from February, 2022. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what did they say? So did, I, they just, did they just throw them away? I, I guess they laughed. I own three of these shirts. Like I own three button down shirts and they were all at the dry cleaner. So did you get them back or not? I got him. Well, what do you mean? Look at this. Oh, Where had, I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I pretty much, I, I couldn't tell you the last time I bought one of those kind of shirts. One of the things I did in the pandemic was I gave up on ties forever. I don't care oh, if it's a course. wedding, a funeral, never whatever. Seen, you've, I'm, you've never worn a tie. I've never seen you in a tie. Yeah, I'm done. I'm, I, I occasionally would wear a tie. I'm done wearing ties. Funeral. Just decided. I, a funeral. A funeral is the last place I will wear a tie. Couldn't you just go sport coat, you know, sport coat? Slacks, I respected. I, res- I respect. I respect the dead. Apparently, you don't. You know what? I, you know what I'm wearing on, uh, on underneath, though. I don't know if you can see. Well, yeah, you can't see. Yeah, you can't see. I'm, I'm wearing khaki bird dogs. <laughs> you have a bird dogs below, and yeah, your party down below, and business up top. Looks great. Thank you. All right, from the Wall Street Journal, they talked about the. Uh, the Fed pause. Okay, this is from Goldman Sachs. Going back to 1982, the S&P 500 returned an average of 19% in the 12 months after the Fed funds rate peaked, according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman studied six Fed tightening cycles over that time. Stocks rose after all but one of them. Which was I, the one where it didn't? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Pro- probably 2007, right? Because didn't they, they raise rates into the great financial crisis? I'm guessing that was it. But I, I, I like stats like this, just in terms of context, but I feel like this is a throw-it-out-the-window situation. Don't you? Where the, the market is so much better at sniffing these things out ahead of time and moving quicker and maybe not reacting the same way, especially this cycle, where I, I would say, not saying it's not going to work, but just saying that banking on this type of thing in this environment, I, I think is, I don't think you can do that anymore. Just anything? No, Any historical- I mean, I mean, for, for, for this kind of thing, don't you think that the markets just move so much faster these days with this stuff? And if, if that was going to be the case, hasn't the market already kind of moved ahead of it? 
like knowing the, the back back in the day, the Fed never talked about what their approach was going to be. They never said anything. Now the right. Fed is is telegraphing everything they're doing. And so I feel like getting ahead of this stuff is a lot easier than it was back in the day. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think also this data wasn't available back then. You know what I mean? It's not like people knew how right. equities would react to a pausing cycle. I think we uh, talked about it. But I think that once they do pause, it's intuitive. It's because they've already done the damage and stocks got killed, you know? This, but this is, this is why it's so difficult to use a back test as like set in stone because you're right, back, back in the day, people didn't have all of these tools and data at their, at their fingertips, right? The, I think, the sto- I think we, we learned the stock market itself, the data, the, the crisp stuff was put together in like the 1960s where people didn't really know what the long-term returns for stocks were. They were just kind of guessing. Like, yeah, stocks for the long run, I get. Like, that wasn't even a thing for people back then. So I think that, that changes how, how the markets react to things. That's all I'm saying. Do you think, do you think most people at this point understand the limitations of a back test? I think, I think that's been established. I, eh, probably not. Regular, really? Regular norm, normal investors. I feel like if, if, if you see a back test tool for the first time in your life and you put something in and you feel like you have it figured out, you look at that and you go, I'm putting all my money in this. Like nah. if, I'm going to pick like, it's like a, you don't think so? No. And, and what's think, a regular investor? First time what's a regular investor? Who are you talking to? Our audience are not regular investors. We've got some smart people out there. We have a sophisticated audience. They know better. All right. I, I just I do think that if if you're a novice investor who's just getting started and you see a back test tool for the first time and you run it, you probably go, I've got it all figured out. I'll just put all my money novice in investors, this. It's like a con- novice investors. Listen, I mean, now I'm pushing back hard. Novice investors don't back test. They I'm just- saying the first time that you get into it and you you try like I, I did this early in my career where I got this back testing tool. It was called like portfolio one, two, three. And I don't know. Someone bought them, but I, but how about you this? Use this it is you, Ben. This is Ben. This is my point. These amazing strategies with these awesome when like you, sharp ratios and when you and I first discovered the ability to backtest stuff, yeah, we probably gave those backtests a lot of credence. But that was a long time ago. I'm saying investors today probably know better than we did. I think you're giving people too much credit. I agree to disagree. You might. Be, I mean, listen. It's right. I, I, you can't. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know? Okay, we're arguing with each other here because maybe maybe my point, earlier point of there being more knowledge, maybe you're right. Maybe maybe people do not. I just think it's easy to get caught up in that when when you try it for the first time without some experience of letting a back test live in the real world. I don't know. I just, I vaguely remember somebody on this podcast saying that investors have gotten smarter. Uh, maybe that's, maybe I'm misremembering that. It, maybe they're smarter because they don't use back tests anymore. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's it. I don't know. Uh, but I want to talk to you about interest rates. Because they had come down quite a bit, especially we were like sort of scratching our chin when the Fed raised rates in March and the two-year drop. The Fed raised rates to 475, 500, the two-year drop below 4%. Remember that? They're kind of, they're coming back up. And I wonder if it's because people are saying, you know what, rates are going to stay higher for longer, or maybe the economy is actually doing okay. Have you looked at interest rates, by the way? Is this news to you? Well. Three month T bill, yeah, a little. I mean, they're they're all over the place, but three month T bills are now at five point one percent, which is a ridiculously good deal. And I've been having a lot of conversations, as have we internally, about what do you? Obviously, T bills is the it's the layup right now in terms of fixed income exposure. Like, why take more risk unless you really are pounding the table for a recession? Why would you ever take? Why would you ever accept a three and a half percent ten year yield when you can get five point one percent in three month T bills? The counter with that would be, well, T bill yields aren't you can't lock those in, right? They're short term, yeah, I mean, they could drop. Yeah. There's but there's I, reinvestment I think that's, risk. And then there's also like, yeah, listen, if if rates do drop, you're not getting any juice, and then you're gonna have to reinvest at lower rates. But do you think that bond investors want care about juice? In terms of I, don't I, think I guess bond, if you do care about I mean, juice. Bond they, investors, the entire what, what is, what's a bond investor? There's a that's like saying a stock investor. Well, okay, getting objectives. back to more – yeah, but if you're not a hedge fund investor who's trying to gauge the macro and guess where you should be on the curve, if you're just a fixed income investor who says, I want to diversify my stock holdings and I don't want this part of my portfolio to get killed, why would you be in anything other than three to six-month T-bills right now for stability and income? 
Well, like I don't think I, I, I don't think you've well, ever if had you, a better. If, if you if you think a recession is coming, your stocks would get killed, and you're not going to get anything out of your bonds. That's why you're going to get five percent for a while. I I I just think that it the being in short term T bills right now is the easiest decision you could make if for your fixed income allocation, and. The problem with that is, is it gets really harder. Like, what happens if it goes from five to three? Then what do you do? Yeah, I think, not, I think that's, not, listen, the, not, that's the hard part. I'm just, I'm just saying, there's no, no brainers. That's all. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that, like, there are reasons to take duration risk. Yeah, but I, I, you say there's no, no brainers. I say it's a no brainer to be in three month T bills right now at five percent. I think that's a no brainer for if you have cash or fixed income needs. I think it's a no brainer, right now. I think it's hubris. How about that? Okay. But here's the thing: the Fed is the Fed is not going to r- drop rates. By the way, I can already, I can, already to- <laughs> I, I can hear the YouTube comments already. Really loving me this episode. Of course, but <laughs> I'm <laughs> fine. You take thirty year, you take your thirty year treasuries, and I'll take my five percent T bills. I'm just and my saying, CDs listen, it doesn't, have to, be, it doesn't have to be. It, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. But anyway, my point, but, right, there, but, there but is no all or nothing. I'm just saying for again for people looking for stability and what you think of for fixed income. It's, it hasn't been this easy in 20, 30 years probably for fixed income investors in terms of I don't have to take any volatility or duration risk right now. I, I just right, think now, we haven't now seen that. Now we're on that. the same page. Yes. The, well, well, yeah, because the 10-year t- the was 2% or whatever for the last decade. So that I completely agree with. But my point is just look at this chart of the two-year. The two-year got as low as like 355 like two weeks ago. And it's up to four one six. I mean, that's a big, big move, no? So anyway, what I was going, where I was going with this is that people were, we were talking about a, a pause in March, given the SVB blowups and all of that, all that sort of noise. Um, and now, now they're still pricing in a high probability of another rate hike in uh, in May. A month ago, Ben, a month ago there was a. 21% implied probability of rates being 500 to 525, meaning a 25%, a 25 basis point increase. That went from 21% up to 91% today. The market is pricing in like a high degree of likelihood of there being another hike. Doesn't it seem uh, weird though that, that three month tables are still 100 basis points more than two year treasuries though? Doesn't that seem bizarre? I just think the bond market is confused in the push yes. and pull between. Wait, there could be a slowdown and a credit crunch to, oh, wait, inflation is still here. I think the bond market is just utterly confused. That, that's my only takeaway here. We were talking last week, I think this was on TCAF actually, about whether or not we were currently in a recession. And uh, our team put this in the YouTube for like a vote. 55% of the audience says we're in a recession. Is that higher or lower than you would have guessed the audience would guess? That's higher to me. I don't think I would have guessed that high. I think you're doing too many podcasts these days, sir. We talked about this survey on this it's very show last week. And I said oh, there's no way. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And I said there's no chance in hell that we are in a recession. That was my stance. Okay. That's like right, right, That's right. right now, we are not in a recession. Could we be could we have a slowdown from here? Sure, but I, I'd say right now, my my take is no recession. What's this bespoke? Retail sales came out last week. Not great. Uh, Bespoke said the diffusion index is the lowest since April 2020, and it has never been this negative outside of a recession. Now, I feel like this sort of stuff should be taken with a grain of salt, given fiscal stimulus that we saw and given how wild people were spending. And I got to be honest, I don't know. I've seen the word diffusion in front of an index twice in the past week. I'm not sure what that means. I was going to say that, too. I I don't know what this diffusion index is. But uh, let's just say it's it's you, it's retail sales. The, let's just use that. Put the gray bars up there. But this is the other, we've been talking about this for months now that all retail sales have to do is get back to normal and that, that could mean a slowdown. Right? They're so yeah. far off trend. Yeah. That it, it's just the biggest collapse in retail spending, just this is just month over month, um, was in gasoline stations. Gas stations. The chart says gasoline station, so I read the chart, but I don't know if anyone calls it a gasoline station. <laughs> speaking no, of, I don't think so. <laughs> speaking of, I went to an interesting gasoline station over the weekend on the way back from Hershey Park. We stopped at like a, 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 a it was like a truck stop, I guess. It was a where is gas that's like in for, Pennsylvania somewhere for truckers. Yeah, we had a great time. Uh, it poured, it, it it rained like cats and dogs, and so that like cleared out the park because it like downpoured for an hour. 
Um, and they have some big boy roller coasters, uh, which was which was fun. But anyway, uh, we stopped at this at this trucker gas station, and there was like a subway in there. Which, by the way, I love subway. It's I haven't had it in like I don't know five years. Big fan. See, you are, you're you're a man fan? of the people. You you love subway and Jimmy John's. Love. I mean, I know Subway's not really good, but I don't care. It's good to me. Uh, I don't mind Subway. But but they're talking about, uh, on the loudspeaker. It's like shower number 78. Your turn is up. And then like five minutes later, it's like shower number 79. Your turn is up. Did you know truck that uh, truck stop? They have, sh- they have showers. It sounds like a prison, but yeah. Yeah. That's how they, uh, what else are they going to do? They're on the, life on the road. Life on the road. Bank of America, credit and debit card spending per household moderated in March to 0.1% year over year, the slowest pace since February 2021. Month over month, spending fell 1.5%. Yeah, obviously the spending's got to slow eventually. I mean, the people are spending like uh, gangbusters. Does, does this mean that all of the anecdotes that you and I are talking about all the time, because we keep talking about the anecdotes of people traveling and spending money and going out into restaurants, is are those anecdotes masking like are, are people substituting spending and they're, they're just focusing on these kind of areas and, and they're maybe not spending on other stuff now because everyone talks about the anecdotes of gosh this plane was full and this theme park was full and these restaurants are full and the prices are ridiculous but if you look at these numbers like this it doesn't seem like spending is continuing to get out of control out of control to the downside or what no the upside we, we keep saying uh-huh. that like it seems like people keep spending and how are these people doing it they must be going into credit card debt that's like the conclusion that the logical conclusion you'd think from all these trips you see people taking but the data doesn't really back that up I sh- I saw a chart I think I can't remember who posted this dang it it was like credit card spending um is I think still below 2019 levels or right thereabouts so this idea that credit card debt is like keeping the consumer alive is uh, well, it's it's back it's, on it's trend. Hog, it's, so it's hogwash. Yeah. Oh, is this it? Credit card. Here we well, go. Yeah. Well, this ba- is it, ben. it basically fell and then came right back up. Yeah. But so this credit, is showing total credit card credit, debt in the country is back on trend, basically. Okay, so average credit card utilization rate by household income. Um, just eyeballing this, it looks like it's back to back to where it was. Actually, the under fifty thousand cohort is. Still very low, over one. Tw- I mean, yeah, this is this is come on. This was this is interesting. We got Empire State Manufacturing data, and it was the first time that it increased in five months. So I don't really know what to make of that. But look at this prices paid chart, the fourth one down. What about what is this showing me here? The prices paid for the Empire State Manufacturing survey. What I'm Ben, this is the numbers are going down. That's what I'm trying to show you. Okay. All right, so here, here's an anecdote that I was talking about. So this is from the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal had a thing saying basically everyone wants to travel to Europe right now, and if you go to any of the resorts in Europe, all you see is Americans. I'm sure this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but... Josh and Chris just went to Europe. Reservations for European trips rose 8% over last summer. Delta Airlines president Glenn Hollenstein said last week that 75% of the carrier's international flights this summer are already booked, even with added flights and seats. So, I mean... What is the cost of a European trip? If you go for seven to 10 days, that's got to be what? 15, 20 grand when you flights and everything. Maybe it's a little cheaper because of the euro or something, but that's an expensive trip, correct? Yes. In these, So are we to assume that, I don't know, is it just rich people spending money these days? Like in all the stuff about everyone's spending money and everyone's going into credit card debt, that, that's kind of, that's just not true? Well, that, well look at this chart. So, so if you have an income over 125k, the the credit card utilization rate, which I'm guessing is like how much people spend divided by their average ba- their max balance, that was like 28 percent or so in 2018 and 2019. That number for households earning over 125k is down to 23 percent. Or are we assuming that people are still just spending down their savings, and it's the it's like the excess savings things. People are still spending down those savings from the pandemic. Because you're right. The, the, I don't know. I feel like a Dude, lot of I don't the, know. I, feel like a, I, I don't I know. I feel like a lot of this data just doesn't match up, though. That's that's my problem. Is it seems like because inflation is higher and people are doing all this stuff and spending money, it seems like the it seems like all this 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 stuff doesn't match up. That's what I'm trying to get at here. I have no idea what's happening. I really don't. I, I, oh, I, I, <laughs> I don't either. Here's a here's an analogy I want to make. This if if this is 
if, if a recession is on the horizon, this is, this is a, a crockpot recession. It is simmering at a low heat. The top is starting to like bounce a little bit, you know, from the liquid or whatever. <laughs> and this is a slow burning recession that uh, will be moderate, I guess, if I can have I, to guess. Can I, can I offer a hot uh, uh, crockpot take? 80% of stuff people make in a crock pot is gross. Well, by definition, like there's, because there's, there's it, some it, stuff people make in a crock pot that's okay. Like my wife makes a great spicy sausage dip. It's mm, just rotel tomatoes and pot. cream cheese and and uh, sausage. It's amazing. Oh, it sounds dip. wonderful. But most stuff people make in a crock pot is gross. Okay. So I don't know if this is a Jewish thing uh, specifically, but Jewish people eat brisket. I'm sure that there are other. Um, and I'm not saying Jews are the only people that eat brisket, but we eat brisket. A brisket needs to be cooked forever, like forever and ever. So it's got to be done in a crock pot. But once you do, if you could cook it long enough and, and it gets like, you know, that texture, I love it. So you're right. It's not a great, pe- not a great cut of meat, but under the right circumstances. All right. What's our Eric Belchunas thread here? That's it? Yeah. Well, well you I have like any, brisket too. I, <laughs> but yeah, but brisket from a but crock any, pot any, is gross. But, you want it from okay. like a smoker or something. Any any thoughts on my analogy there? No, I agree. Crock pot it's, recession. It's not. By the way, Wall, people, Wall, Street, Wall Street Journal. Uh, you could you could take that one as rich, opposed to the one that Ben session. actually stole from you. You could take this one. So I do agree. I think a lot of people want it to be like an event. Like the the headline's going to come out that today we went into a recession. And you're right. <laughs> right. If it happens, we're, we're going to slowly. It's the the Jerry Seinfeld soda machine where it takes a few pushes to get the, if you want to tip a pop machine over, it's going to take a few pushes. To, it goes back and forth. That's what this recession is going to be like. How that? It's a soda pop yeah. recession. And I don't say soda. It's pop machine. But I know the people in the, the coast pop. like yeah, soda. No, that, yeah. that works too. Uh, soda pop sounds right. like something from someone would say in the 1950s wearing like a varsity jacket. I, you know, adults say pop. Okay. Thread from Eric Balchunas. Vanguard took in a billion dollars a day in Q1. Up against 10-year rolling flows to 2.3 trillion. No one else is close. 30 bill went into its money market fund. Let's see. He says Vanguard was more or less the only buyer of US equities in Q1. Wow. I don't uh okay. I don't know about that. So maybe no, really maybe no one to... is doing a back test. I, I'm saying I'm, I'm sure he when he says that he probably means like net he netted it all out in Vanguard yeah, was yeah. the the net buyer. He said they they let ETF flows. 36% of the second place. I mean, they're just, they're dominating. It looks like so Vanguard. So it says Vanguard took in $13 billion in Q1. The rest of the industry combined saw outflows. Right. Wow. That's, That's a wild. great stat. That, but that, that also just bits. shows Vanguard's scale. Relentless bid staying relentless. And the scale and the behavior of Vanguard investors is truly unique. But look at this next chart. This is really what I wanted to, wanted to get to. Balchuna said, we expect Vanguard to dominate ETFs for quite a while and surpass BlackRock and market share in the next two years or so. Not only do they have the natural demand, but also be... Look at the mutual funds. This is where I'm going with this. Mutual funds still make up three quarters of their assets. That's crazy. That is pretty wild. Is that just because they're all buy and hold investors and didn't want to change over or 401ks? Or what do you think the reason for that I think, is? I think, I think both. I think both. Okay. All right. Here's a hot take for you. Is Warren Buffett actually bad for investors? Ready? This uh, is from... What? Jason Z- <laughs> So remember we talked last. Remember we talked last week about... Uh, about outperformance. And the funny thing was, I wrote a blog post about the outperformance thing. Like, would you rather outperform in a bull market or a bear market? And you said bear, and a lot of people agreed with you. But the funny thing was, is I got a lot of people who said, I prefer to outperform in a bull market and a bear market. And these people weren't kidding. And I said, well, if you can do that, then you need to be charging three and 30, sir, because uh, you're, a, you're an amazing investor if you can do that. Anyway, Jason Zweig had this date, and we've talked about this from uh, Professor Bessenbinder, who I think is at Arizona State. He, he talked about how Half the stocks have ever generated positive returns over their lifetime, and 4.3% of stocks created all net gains in the U.S. market between 1926 and 2016. That's when we were were trying to reach for last week. So he said that, uh, unsurprisingly, studies have shown that on average, the fewer stocks a fund owns, the lower its returns. So the more concentrated you are, the lower your returns. Over 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25-year periods, uh, funds holding at least 100 positions outperform those with fewer than 50. Over all those same periods, except the past five years, the most diversified funds also earned higher returns than those with 50 to 99. So 
if the more diversified you are, the better your returns, which a lot of people would think would be the opposite. But the point is, I would have have thought the opposite. That's interesting. Because you have these grand slam stocks like Apple and Amazon. If you aren't in those stocks, if you miss one of those, you're screwed. So it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but owning an index fund and being more diversified increases your odds of outperformance of all other investors. I just want to make one clarifying statement with this data, which is what it is. I think, I mean, I trust the data, um, which is supporting index fund investors, buy and hold, and I'm an advocate for that. I get it. However, however, so what this is showing is like, basically, if you buy a stock and hold it forever, it's not worth owning relative to owning a basket of stocks. Just generally speaking, most stocks are lousy investments, which I agree with. Yes. However, however, active investors obviously, are not buying a stock at inception and holding it for its duration. So just because a company has a lousy lifetime return doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to make money. Yes. For example, for example, I just sold Facebook, not to brag. Uh, The stock might be down. I'm making it. Let's say the stock is a stock could be down 60 percent over a three year period, but it it still could have gained 100 percent over a three month period. You know what I mean? And, I, and I, obviously knew, I knew that you, I knew that you sold Facebook because you shared the receipts with us on Slack. I feel like you were getting ahead of this for me. Well, I, sh- I, I shared receipts because you asked for receipts. So what, what, what are the numbers? No, that, I mean, that's a, that's I, a fair point. I, I think, but I think the reason that concentrated portfolios underperform is because you have an extreme, like the people who outperform outperform by a ton. And there's way more people who underperform with a concentrated portfolio. So like that, yeah. that is, if you want to outperform, a concentrated portfolio is the way to do it, but very well, few it depends people how can much, do, no, be it depends it. How much do you want to outperform by? Because if you, the more diversified you are, the less likely you are to significantly outperform. Yes. And significantly Although underperform. The, the, the surprising one there is that Peter Lynch used to own like thousands of stocks. I, I, he, he did? He might have taken small positions. He had a, he had a, he had a very, he had a lot of holdings at his companies. Yes. If you go back to the Peter Lynch that. stuff. Um, all right. I listened to a lot of conference calls this week. Uh, and one of the interesting charts is from Charles Schwab. By the way, I bought Schwab. I used some of my proceeds from, uh, from Facebook to buy Schwab. You're pivoting from tech to finance. Well, just, just as the piece. Um, but look at this chart. Transactional cash per account. It shows p- cash per account and cash as a percentage of of uh, the portfolio. And it's as low as it's been. This chart goes back to 2004. Only 5% of people, only 5% of a balance is in cash, like just cash sitting in an account, not like non-interest bearing cash, getting whatever, 40 base points, whatever, whatever the minimum is. Uh, but I guess my point is that, like for that to be the low in 2004, just eyeballing this, what do you think the average is? Is the average like 10%? I think if you had to pinpoint, answer. if you had to pinpoint one, vi- like general investor misbehavior, I would say, is holding too much cash in general. Like, there's no reason to have. Invested. Right. Yeah. If you're, if this is a brokerage account, like your cash should be your cash, and I'm, I'm all for having a cash buffer, but there's no reason to have a 10% cash drag in your in- long-term investing portfolio. I would be surprised if this number doesn't rise in the coming months. Because So with Robinhood's cash sweep, which you don't have to do anything for, I think they pay 4.4%. And I do feel like people will see that and go, ooh, I think I'm just going to hold off and wait for stocks for a little longer. I think a lot of people will have that mindset. If, if it's just a cash sweep and it's giving you that much money, why? I think some people will feel very comfort, comfortable doing that and just sitting there. I'm very com- Yeah, I'd feel very comfy in 4% too. Absolutely. But I, I agree. That's why you have to define, like, what is this account for? Is this account for stocks or do I have to have an asset allocation in here? Because if it's for stocks and you're trying to time it and you're probably not going to win that game. All right. Uh, is inflation thing happening here? I, I looked at the last 10 annualized inflation readings. So every month they give out the annualized number. that It peaked at 9.06% in June, right? It has been down in the last nine readings since then, right? And the last one actually was... Technically, if we're going decimal points, 4.98%. We're under 5%. So there is a there is a trend here. Obviously, the counterpoint for a lot of people would be, yes, the rate of change is slowing, but all that inflation is cumulative, and prices overall are still higher, even if they're rising 
at a lower rate. But I think if you take but those, both are true. Both are true. Yes, it's a it's a but good policy, trend. But, but, I think po- if, but policy decisions are based on the latest number, right? Policy decisions are not made based on cumulative inflation. It's based on where it is today. Other people have done this. I haven't done it. But don't you think once the June and July and August numbers start falling off, the 9% and the 8.5%, that we're going to be at 3 3.5% by, I don't know, end of this summer, probably? I don't Just know. By yeah, I'm sure you could easily do that I, on a spreadsheet. I don't know what the numbers are. But Jeremy Schwartz has a, has a, has a tweet. He said, a few chart updates with our CPI calculations that include alternative shelter components. Officially, CPI shows headline inflation of 5% in the last 12 months. Our calculations show under 3%. Inflation was much higher in reality before and now much lower. So based on the way that inflation shelter is calculated, there are some shenanigans with a lag going on. And according to Jeremy's calculation, inflation is, is under 3%. All right, I read this this morning. I thought this was a good one. What is the average inflation rate in the last five years in this country? Inclusive of all the 8 or 9% we've had, what's the average inflation rate? Uh, 3%. 3.3%, which is basically the average of the last 100 years. So you take the near deflation we saw in the pandemic, add it to the really high inflation we've had since then, and you get the average, the long-term average. Fun with numbers, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I'd say bullshit with numbers, but point taken. Okay. Uh, question from a listener. You talked about how baby boomers have so much money for a generation and anecdotally so many financial plans that I run for our folks have them with way more than they need. They're diligent savers and investors, and it goes back to how Morgan Housel will talk about growing up with a Depression-era parents feeling totally uncomfortable spending money. So we have all these boomers with excessive savings and investments that are unwilling to turn the switch and actually spend that money. And anecdotally, we hear this from our advisors all the time. All the time. Chris, who runs our wealth management division, says he's constantly having talks with people trying to trying to get them to spend money. And a lot of people just don't. And not only that, I feel like we the our advisors, they share the wins. Like when you get a client to buy the car or the house or the whatever that they've been like working, you know, their entire life for, it's a huge win. Yeah, that is a win. Yeah. And we love seeing those pictures and stuff. So the question becomes, do we have a permanent floor of higher inflation in the future if boomers decide to actually spend that cash? Or do they pass it on to the next generation, which does not have the depression era parents and are more comfortable spending? Uh, and so could there be a higher rate from either of these things if that money gets spent? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that I think that it's interesting because on the one hand, there might we legitimately might have a retirement crisis. Um, but also there are people that like the. I don't say the average American that has access to a 401k, and I know that's not, you know, I know that like half of the country doesn't have access to, but for for the average boomer that spent, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s aughts contributing to their retirement account um, that are in decent financial shape, I think a lot of them are going to leave a lot of money behind because the older you get, your, your spending slows dramatically. You do have social security. Uh, people are people are probably cautious because they feel they fear outliving their money, and so as a result, they spend less. So I don't. I, I think that boomers are not going to spend down their retirement the accounts. I know is, again, we're it's a su- broad brush here, but it, it's a succession thing where ten percent of the households own ninety percent of the equities. So unfortunately, most of that money getting passed down is going to be from rich parents to rich kids. Yeah. And it's not going to be so that that kind of does away with the inflation thing in my mind, because it's not like it's this this broad money that's going spread out to everyone and everyone can spend more. It's unfortunately going from rich people to rich people. And that yeah. unfortunately, that's how it is. All right. We've talked about this before. The Atlantic had this article saying the millennial generation is just fine by 2019, even adjusted for inflation. The income, median income for millennial household was 9,000 higher than that of Gen X at the same age and 10,000 higher than the median boomer household in 2019. And the pandemic didn't really change that at much. Household incomes chart. of 25 to 44 year olds were at historic highs in 2021. Yeah. So you look at average real wealth and that's just for inflation. It's kind of crazy. Gen X is higher now than baby boomers at the same age. Millennials are right on trend. Gen Z is on trend. And they're so basically going over this myth that all millennials are broke. And my my question is, well, why dude, do our we- parents, our parents were in their mid twenties in the in the mid seventies. You know, that was that a was that a great time to be a millennial right. back then or a boomer our age? No, right? Or buying a house with twenty percent mortgage rates. I, so 
The point is millennials are are right where they should be based on other generation, generational trends. And I'm guessing because millennials are more highly educated, you see this household income by education, millennials are going to make more money over their careers. Millennials are going to be the richest generation ever. And then Gen Z will be the, it's, it's going to happen like that. So why do you think millennials feel so poor then? Why do we always see these stories about millennials can't do this and millennials can't do that? Because they're saying yeah. even home ownership, at the same age, 50% of boomers owned their home compared with 48% of millennials at the same age. So even the housing thing is not as bad as people make it out to be. So why is it that I, I, I millennials- think, I think the, ma the main difference has to be just uh, uh, college costs. People are being buried in debt coming out of college. Our parents did not have that. They also okay. didn't so, have. So, they also didn't have social media to make them feel shitty about themselves. I think that's part of it. So, you, so even if the incomes are higher, the expenses are higher too, and more in your face. I think so. Yeah. So you'd say, well, also, tuition also, costs are higher, also, housing costs are higher, you know what daycare else they costs didn't are have? higher. You know what else our parents didn't have? Uh, the obsession with clicks. Right. True. Like obviously there was advertising in the seventies, but it wasn't like fear porn like it is today. You know, one of the, one of the things I was thinking of the boomer millennial thing, I was, my daughter has gymnastics on Thursday nights and I was taking her there and, uh, she likes me to watch, but I usually just bring my computer and watch. And, uh, you hear all the parent conversations and you hear this at every sporting event or whatever, every kid's event. And the ki the parents talk about how busy they are because the kids have to go to this and they have to do this. And my and every parent just loves to talk about how busy they are because their kids are constantly doing stuff. And I feel like that's something boomer parents never talked about or complained about. Maybe they didn't have the travel sports stuff and they didn't have as many things to do. But don't you feel like parents of today love talking about parenting way more than the previous generations did? I have no frame of reference. I wasn't, I mean, you don't think our parents complained? I mean, probably not to us, but I feel I like, know. I feel like, I don't, don't, you, don't you feel like our parents ignored us more or <laughs> didn't, <laughs> I guess maybe this is a helicopter parent thing, but I don't feel like there was as much of a, a focus uh, my, on uh, my, my mother parenting as like the thing. What? Well, yeah. my mother was very strict to me. Yeah, but I got I punished like for the entire, in eighth grade, I was punished. I was punished the entire eighth grade. You probably deserved it though. <laughs> no, I'm not even talking about being, they probably, I bet the boomer parents were more strict, but I don't think that they, they were as involved in the lives of their kids as, as parents are today. Yeah. In yeah, terms of like the planning and the, we, we never had a less, calendar on our fridge for our, for no, when I was true. growing up it was, you know, that kind that kind of thing. Everyone has that now. Last night I randomly said to Rob and I was like, do you think we're doing a good job? She's like, what do you mean? I said, as parents. <laughs> it's, it's hard I to tell, so. right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you do your best and yeah. All right, this is a good one from Stephen Ratner. Tight labor market has led to record gains for workers at the bottom, even after inflation. By contrast, it took till 2017 for the bottom half of Americans to climb back to pre-Great Recession levels of income. So this is showing, again, that the bottom 25% has seen the biggest wealth gains. And, and they saw the biggest drop-off during the pandemic as well. And now they're right back on trend. And this, to me is probably one of the more surprising charts of any economics charts of, of, and there's been a lot of surprising ones, that if you were to say inflation is, is out of control and at you know four decade highs, but the bottom 25% is seeing the biggest wage gains because of it. Has this ever happened before? No, and the way question, our I don't, society, don't think so, right? The way our society is structured, people are very upset about this because who pays for the bottom 25%? People with money, right? Right. And people with money, are, <laughs> it, it literally, is money yes. are, literally, are literally paying their wages and there's inflation. And so, no, society will definitely not cheer this on even though it is objectively they should. a good thing. They should. This is a good thing, right? This is, there's no federal minimum wage that was raised, but the pandemic effectively raised the minimum wage and it's higher than it's ever been. And it like... I don't know, doubled probably in the last three years. Yeah, I agree. So if you're going to the restaurant, and you're complaining about higher prices for food and drinks that you're paying higher wages for people who who needed a boost and they got it. Uh, all right, let's talk about crypto just for a second, which has been on an incredible tear. Bitcoin started. Very the, it's uh, a very cool. You know, how, you know, how like in an, an NBA playoff game, they'll go like he's got a quiet 30 points tonight. I feel like Bitcoin is up a quiet 100% from the bottom. 
Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I think most regular people aren't talking about it, given how burned they got. But Bitcoin started the year. At what do you mean when you What do you mean when you say regular people? People do back tests or don't do back tests? Non crypto natives. I feel like we've been we've been defining regular people six different ways. I'm just trying to. It's it started the year at sixteen five. Now it's at thirty, um, and and maybe one of the reasons why we don't discuss it a lot is because meaning we Americans is uh, I don't know why, but. It leads me to this point. So Data Trek said, this is uh, Nicholas, said virtual currencies are much more of a global phenomenon than many U- U.S. investors may realize. For example, Google Trend search volume data shows that the countries with the greatest collective interest in virtual currencies and related events in the space are in Europe, Africa, Asia, Central America, and the Middle East. The United States rarely makes the top 10. And I think this makes sense because we have by far the best financial uh infrastructure in the entire world like for i don't know for all americans like why do we need crypto well i also think there was enough there was enough ink spilled on crypto and enough talking points made that i think people are sick of talking about it until something actually happens and there's an actual use case or i I think people just that's why there's no talking about because people are sick of talking about what could it be and people are ready to hear like what will it be we don't we're not worried about uh, the government stealing our money or, you know, serious debasement. And I could hear the crypto max is going nuts right now, but you know what I mean? It's uh, the, we're, there's not a third world country. Our, our dollars are pretty, are pretty secure. Um, despite inflation. All right, let's talk about, uh, AI. Did you see this thing? Uh, somebody tweeted the music industry is about to change forever. This AI generated songs created by ghostwriter 9777 is blowing up on TikTok. It features AI Drake featuring the weekend and is so good. Did you listen to this? I didn't. Uh, I don't like listening to Drake's regular music, so I'm not going to listen to an AI generated one. But uh, I don't know. This kind of thing doesn't worry me as much because I think there's going to be lawsuits up the ass for this stuff, and I think this stuff is going to get this stuff is going to get cut down before it ever takes off. You think that the music industry and the movie industry is going to let AI take over? Like that's my big thing about AI is the established players are not just going to let this happen on a creative field. Don't you think? Like you think the artists are going to let AI take their voices without getting paid somehow? No. There's no way I mean, this is I, ever going to happen. I, I, well, I don't how about this. I don't have I don't have really any opinions cuz I don't, you know, we'll see. But uh Andrew the Metaverse guy Steinwald tweeted, "I'm pretty freaked out about job losses from AI. This is not like we created a new tractor for farmers that requires 10 fewer farmers. AI is a tool that re- that will require fewer people fewer people for all work. This is like the release of a new mega tractor for every industry all at the same time. Overblown or somewhere in between or what? I think one of the reasons tech people are freaking out so much, maybe it's because they understand it better than us, but it's also because aren't tech people the most at risk of their job losses here? Don't you think tech people are the ones who are should be scared the most of AI replacing them? I really don't know. I, I think that there are... Because I'm thinking about the stuff that's not going to change. In, yeah, but mostly knowledge industries. Like I don't know. I, I, I think about the stuff that AI is not going to replace in my life. Right? Like any of the physical stuff, like is AI going to change the personal trainer at your gym or something? Is it like I feel like a lot of the physical stuff you do in the real world, they're not people don't have to worry about. I think it's the people who are in the tech sector who are going to have to worry the most. Because if you can tell an AI... Do this coding for me. It does it as quick as 10 engineers. Shouldn't tech people be the most worried? And maybe that's why they're freaking out so much. Within the next five years, will there be some sort of, I don't know if societal upheaval is too strong of a word, but will there be a cultural divide between people that use AI and people that were laid off because of it? I don't think that's far-fetched. It could be. I also think that it's going to, there's, there's going to have to be, AI is going to create jobs as well. I know people keep talking about the jobs it's going to take away there's going to have to be some sort of filter there where people can help use it and explain it. Like the music industry stuff, I'm sure people are going to be using it. I'm sure the musical artists are going to be using it to help help them make music, just like they use more technology than they did in the past. So I think, I think people forget about how many jobs technology actually creates over time too. But yeah, there, there's certain industries for sure that are going to, I would love, you'd think the call center thing would be, how many, I don't know how many millions of people work at call centers around the world. That, that's the kind of thing where AI probably will take it away. But I don't know. Remember five years ago, Scott Galloway had that thing that there, like, there are more cashiers in the country than teachers or something. And people were worried about, well, Amazon's going to have this grocery store that's going to take away all the cashier jobs. And you see it at McDonald's. Now. I mean, has that caused like 
riots in the streets because there's not as many cashiers because now we have the self-scan stuff. But I, I think like this the, is this the, guy's point is that this is this is coming for every industry. There, I don't know if there's ever been anything like that. Okay. I don't think it's coming for every industry, though. That's my point. There's some physical stuff that I, that a computer just can't do, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not going to take everybody's job, but I, I do think that it's going to be uh, – we will revisit so you, this issue on, on future podcasts. So New York Post, I, I said I think AI is going to probably do more harm than good, even if it does a lot of good. So AI cloned teen girl's voice in $1 million kidnapping scam that says, I got your daughter. The mother said, I oh, never doubted so for awful. one second that it was her. That's the freakiest part that really got to my core. That's uh, so uh, awful. Ugh. This is kind of, you sent us an email. Someone, didn't someone threaten to assassinate you? Oh, Is it an yeah. AI bot? <laughs> I gotta be honest. I gotta be honest. As as hilariously worded as that email was, I there was a second where I was like, "Wait a minute." Wasn't I've it, got. It similar, wasn't even asking you for anything. Didn't it just say like, "I'm going to assassinate you"? <laughs> you have no. I've got, sorry. Nothing you can do. I've gotten similar emails accusing me that they've seen me doing, let's just say, inappropriate things. And so I called my friend and he goes, dude, I got, he goes, I got the exact same email. Everyone gets that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pay us uh, money. We're going to share. But the funny thing is, let's say someone did have a video of you doing something very inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, I was about to call Robin and say, our, 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 our life, our, our life is over. <laughs> <laughs> my um, friend did. My friend, my friend literally, and I only know this because it's like, an, we, we joke about this today. My friend replied because he's such a dumb, dumb. He replied, I don't think he knew that it was fake. He replied, F you, send it. <laughs> <laughs> Called their bluff. All right, maybe this is the reason that many millennials are still unhappy, even though the incomes are the same. Uh, Lance Lambert, in March 2023, or March, 23% of the nation's 200 largest housing markets registered a month over month decline. 77% of the markets registered an increase. So he has this cool chart that shows that percentage that are growing versus declining. And the declining happened for a while, and now it's going in the opposite direction, and a lot of these housing markets are rising again. Back to him. Among the nation's 400 largest housing markets tracked by Zillow, 218 are back to or just set a new all-time high for housing prices. This doesn't seem like it should be happening in a world with housing prices that are 50% higher and 7% mortgage rates. Yeah, do, do you think that? not great. Are we just not going to get, I mean, I guess if mortgage rates stayed at 7% for another five years, like housing prices would have to just churn lower and lower. But I, I do think that there's a scenario where how mortgage rates go to 5% and the whole housing thing just kind of puts a floor under it. And we never see even a big correction people were looking for. There's yeah. obviously some places yeah. that are seeing it, but. If rates stay at 7% for the next three years, we will definitely see housing prices come lower. And I say definitely, I think definitely. Uh, but if we don't, then you're right. Maybe we don't get the big correction that, that we've been waiting for. I just for. think that like, the, way, the affordability yeah, back to 2019 levels is, unfortunately, I think a pipe dream for that, like, a lot might, of people. Like, I'll just wait till, yeah. it's, I, don't think, I don't think that's ever coming back. So Lance Lambert, again, among, among the nation's 400 largest housing markets tracked by Zillow, 218 markets are back too, or just set a new all-time high for house prices. Man, if you're, if you're, yeah, I mean, I feel for people our age and younger who are trying to get into a home, it's brutal. Do you want me to point out the fact that I just read that piece or not? Uh, please. You know what? That's, that's my bad. I, I apologize. We got a, we got an email that was, we had an email that caught my attention and hand up. Sorry. That's fair. I was going to let it slide. Mike. Mike Simonson, median price of a single family home is still four thirty nine nine, up a tad over twenty twenty two. Median price of new listings is three ninety nine, four percent lower than last year. And again, these are these are both going up again. Uh, this is interesting. Can I say? I mean, can I, I, say, can I say not good? No, not good. And, and so Adam Azamek uh, had this new paper out, and he talks about this is an interesting piece. He's like, if so, the the research shows remote work caused like sixty percent of the increase in prices, which I don't know how you do the attribution there, but let's say it's plus or minus 20% there, like that remote work had a big piece of it. His point is, why did rents and housing prices go up in big cities then if people were leaving them during the pandemic? And his answer was household formation. And so I think this is the thing that the wave of millennials who want to buy houses and form households is so big that it's, it's, it's dwarfing 
these other financial spreadsheet aspects of higher rates and higher prices in that the demographic thing is just the, the thing that's, that's, it's the tail wagging the dog. And that, mm-hmm. that is why the prices keep is, are going to have a floor on them is the millennial household formation stuff is just, that's the thing. It's, it's a Harry, Trump card, listen, right? Harry, Harry Dunn said it many years ago. Demographics <laughs> is destiny. By the All way, right, I haven't seen him, have not, have not seen him predicting a crash lately. Is he, he must, I'm sure he's still bearish, right? I haven't seen him. Every, in, every six months, there's a new biggest crash in history that's coming. Just wait. Someone sent me this. It's the average rents in Manhattan by a uh, number of bedrooms. So it's studio, one bedroom, two bedroom. Studio is 3,200. Uh, one bedroom, 4,200. Two bedroom, 6,000. And three bedroom, 10,800. This is average prices. Manhattan feels like a made up place to me. Right? Maybe maybe this I've is never, your point about New York. It's not just New York, it's Manhattan, but I've never lived in Manhattan. I can never afford it. I mean it's I can see why. If these are average prices, holy sm- it just it feels like a made up place to me. I My f- my first apartment lease was in Astoria. And Rob and I were just talking about this the other day. I think we paid we and we had a good we had a good apartment. Like relatively speaking. And I think we paid $2,000. For like a, a big one bedroom, like that apartment the, is definitely probably four thousand right now. The the person in me that remembers my twenties totally understands why people would move to New York and everything about it. And the old middle aged man in me looks at these numbers and says, "This is I don't get it." Like I, it's like a competing thing in me where like I do get it, but I still don't get it. Well, you get it for young people. people. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. it's a, it's an incredible place to spend your twenties. Yes, I guess you that's know, why. Then, yeah, you get four roommates and yeah. All right. Um, all right. Let's skip this private stuff. Um, all right. Great quarter, guys. I was I was slacking with Ben and Josh this morning. That quarter was so freaking awesome. Uh, and we're investors in quarter. Just full disclosure, I've mentioned that before. I um, I was listening to Goldman Sachs live this morning. I jumped onto the conference call live and even in the live chat or the live conference call, you could still rewind. Does Goldman CEO DJ the, the hold music as you're waiting for he the call does, to start? He uh, does David's DJ, David Sally. He does the opening remarks. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was, uh, so Goldman's, cautious, Goldman, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to Goldman's numbers, but is this? Can I get on top of this one? Is Lloyd Blankfein going to come back and take over Goldman Sachs? <laughs> right, uh, not bad. All right, you, so you can steal uh, that one. We've got so next week is the big week. Next week is forty-two percent of uh, the S and P reporting. This week we've got Netflix after the bell. I am still holding, uh, so we'll see there. So you sold Facebook, um, still holding Netflix. Yeah, still holding. Well, because I just feel like I mean whatever. Uh, Jamie Dimon said, the U.S. economy continues to be on generally healthy footings. However, storm clouds remain on the horizon. Banking industry adds to remote. Okay. Um, I feel like he is the, he's a master at talking out of both sides of his mouth. He can always rec- talk about how things are fine, but there could be a crisis. You never know. They reported record numbers as they seemingly always do. And I have to say, like, all of the Jamie uh, adulation, it's deserved. It really is. I listened to, I listened to David Solomon. I listened to, uh, I listened to Schwab. I listened Walt Benninger, who was who was very who did great. I listened to um, Larry Fink, who was just reading prepared remarks. Jamie is the best at on conference calls. Like he lets his CFO answer like the specific financial related questions about whatever, but he jumps in. He's like, "Can I just can I just jump in?" Like, and he just it's just slaying just demolishing the entire call uh he's in a class of his own all right at least on conference calls um so for example i pulled this quote i thought this was interesting he said they're talking about like fed funds where he said first of all i don't believe it i don't quite believe it so the rate curve the fed has a rate curve the forward short-term rate curve almost one percent higher than what the market has so one of the things you got to always prepare for is it could be anything we don't know what the rate curve is going to be in the year. And so we're quite cautious in that and quite thoughtful about that. Obviously, the short-term rate is higher recessionary risk, but – and then inflation coming down. So I think inflation will come down a little bit. It could be easier to – it could easily be stickier than people think, and therefore the rate curve will have to go up. Anyway. Um, He's confused just like oh, us. We, 
Well, that's what I was, that's what I was getting to. So we were talking about it earlier in the show, like what is the bond market saying? What is this market saying? There's a lot of confusion. Yeah. Across every Which, part of the economy. That's, that's the Munger quote. If you're, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. Especially now. All right. Uh, Bank of America. Look at this. So we talk about like, Credit crunch and 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 all that sort of stuff. But look at the look at the banks. So you've got you've got the net income at an all time high. You've got common equity tier one capital and the ratios trending in the right direction. I thought this was interesting. They did they look at like net charge offs. It was up uh, to eight hundred seven million, up from six hundred eight million the quarter before and five hundred twenty million the quarter before that. So that's creeping up. They said. Uh, they said consumer net charge-offs uh, driven primarily by higher credit card losses. So the credit card loss rate in the first quarter was 2.2%. It was 1.7% in Q4, and it was 3% in 2019, which is important. So prior to the pandemic, it was 3%. So it's rising, but it's still 2.2%. So really nothing nothing to speak of there. Look at this next chart, Ben. Digital volumes. Are you? I don't know what Erica is, um, but I am a Zelle user. And checks written, it shows a chart of, of Zelle transactions versus checks. When are checks going to, I mean, checks are in secular decline, right? That's a bear market. Yeah, I still see old people using them at the grocery store occasionally. But it, yeah, it's kind oh, of thing really? that should be. You haven't seen at that before? At the grocery before? store. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I saw, I went, to, I went to the movie theater this weekend with Josh to see The Big Lebowski, the 25th anniversary. You know in the opening scene where he writes a check out for milk? <laughs> I, uh, that that is the definition of a rewatchable movie that only gets better as you watch it more the most times. rewatchable okay average deposit trend so bank of america knows something about deposits i don't know if they're the biggest consumer bank in the world but they're either they gotta be in the top three look at uh you see anything here ben to cause alarm or anything i mean no i know this is, ba- I know this is backwards stronger? i know this is backwards looking but look at look remember at the when there was a banking, remember there was a banking crisis well, they were a huge, they were a beneficiary, but look at the weekly deposit, the weekly deposit and the deposit trends. It shows interest bearing, non-interest bearing a total. Nothing going on here. I feel like every time a bank or a credit card releases something, it's like this next chart. Consumer, consumer something remains strong. Consumer, consumer whatever remains strong, right? This is credit yeah. worthiness. Now, again, I, I know, I know that this is backward looking and the SVB stuff happened in the third, in the tail end of this first quarter. So I get it. We'll find out next quarter. But forget about that because even prior to the banking stuff, people were worried about the economy rolling over, the consumer rolling over. And they might, but it's a crockpot recession, Ben, if we're heading towards one. They might. It just hasn't happened for the last year. There's there's the title to the show right there. Crockpot, crockpot recession. recession? Okay. Um, all right. I want to get... I want to give a plug to a company that we invested in about a year ago that's been building something for financial advisors. There are, so I've been thinking about a lot about this, Ben. Our tech stack that the advisor, financial advisor uses is pretty mature, right? Like there's not a lot of gaps. There's very few things that we're still using a spreadsheet to do. One of those things though- Besides my is, personal budget. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't believe that. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no personal finance tools out there. One of the things that we're still doing is, and this is not my world, but we have a lot of clients where this applies to, is modeling out, dynamically modeling out like their equity compensation and how that impacts their taxes and all that sort of stuff. This is a crazy data point. There was $762 billion of tax under withholding in 2021 alone. So what does that mean, like under withholding? That means that there was $762 billion worth of surprise taxes that people had to pay that they didn't know that they owed money on. So this company, uh, led by Russell Kroger, who was a financial advisor that was sick and tired of doing this in a spreadsheet. That was me in 2021. Called. I had to write a big, I had to write a big check. Well, I did a little bit you. of planning this past year. Shame yeah. on you. So this, so this company, Triacto, helps financial advisors model equity comp for their clients and helps them understand the tax implications like this under withholding that we just discussed. So I think for financial advisors that are working with clients that have this sort of stuff, it's going to be a must- a must have. Well, we, we showed this li- to some of our advisors and, and you asked them after we had a call with in a demo, is this a want to have or need to have? And they said, this is a need to have. Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty good buy signal. So we're going to link to this, this, uh, Triacta website in the show notes. They're still early. 
Um, they've been building. There should be like a fully functional, and the product doesn't exist. There's like an MVP there, but there should be a fully functional product later in the summer. If you want to join the wait list, Russell will reach out to you individually. So you're not going to go into a black hole. Reach out and he will reach, reach out to you. Okay, uh, that's that. Um, skip the banking thing button? here. Skip you want to skip this? All right, yeah. you saw, I know we're running late, but sorry, there's a lot to get to today. You saw Apple's new high-yield savings account? I'm wondering what their end goal here is doing this. So here's the deal. I mean, they did the credit card. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really understand it, I don't think but the, I, I'm sure I don't, there's something. I don't, I don't know if the credit card took off. I kind of remember Goldman, the partnership with Goldman Sachs not working well, but whatever. Starting today, Apple Card users can choose to grow their daily cash rewards with a savings account from Goldman Sachs, which offers 4.15%. But here's the other thing. Because I was thinking like, well, is it only for cash rewards? They said once a savings account is set up, all future daily cash earned by the users will be automatically deposited into the account. Uh, the daily cash destination can also be changed at any time, and there's no limit on how much daily cash users can earn. To build on their savings even further, users can deposit additional funds into their savings account through a linked bank account. Good question so from Duncan. The uh, they're working with Goldman Sachs. Goldman's Marcus account pays 3.9%. How is Apple getting more right. from Goldman than we are? I guess because Apple's not Tim looking Cook. to make money off of this, or they're they're you know they're not. This is this is the I don't know if they're subsidizing this, but they're just they're taking a much smaller spread because they don't care. Right. Pretty wild. What if what if Apple becomes like a big player in financial services? I would. That's I've always thought it should have been Amazon, but if Apple does it, I'd I'd be happy to let them manage well, my money for me. I, I know I'm jumping around just one sec, but speaking of Amazon, Ben, you were you were ahead of the. You were prescient in your. Remember, you said like you want Amazon to like build high speed Wi Fi everywhere. Oh yeah. Well, there's there's a service that they have called. I don't know how to pronounce this. It's K U I P E R. Kuiper. 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 So uh, Andy Jassy in the letter wrote, Kuiper is another example of Amazon innovating for customers over the long term in an area where there's high customer need. Our vision for Kuiper is to create a low Earth orbit satellite system to deliver high quality broadband internet service to places around the world that don't currently have it. Boom, Ben, credit to you, you nailed it. Anything else you want to see Amazon do while while we have their attention? I kind of, I kind of forgot about the uh, the only thing I want from them is them to come break down all the boxes for me in my garage. If they could do that, just bring a box cutter and break them down and take them away for me, reuse them. <laughs> so I don't have to bring them to the dump all the time. Big dump, Big dump guy, guy here. Still, still going. <laughs> One twice last week. All right. Uh, what else we got? Any recommendations? Uh, we had a full uh, doc this week. Uh, we had a very full doc this week. What, what page am I on here? Uh, oh, before, 41 pages before we get this to the, week. Incredible. Yeah, we went hard this week. Before we get to some recs, this, is, this, is a, this tweet made me, made me think. I don't think we've spent enough time marveling at the fact that Meta completely upended its business, renamed itself, and insisted that the Metaverse was the next big thing, only to have AI prove that entirely wrong like six months later. That really is kind of wild. And I mean, I guess I, I, sold, I sold Facebook because I think that they already got a lot of the benefit of the layoffs and cost-cutting. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not shot in Freud and hope the sack gets killed, but... Uh, Anyway, just this this thing is just kind of nuts, right? Like, think about what they really did. Are they going to change their name back yeah. to Facebook? It was a huge miss. Meta.ai they maybe their name? is the next. I don't know. They can't. It's that's like a dog with a tail between its legs, right? No, but but they're already but they're already like back away from the metaverse. I, you know what? Prediction: They changed their name back to, to Facebook. All right. That wouldn't surprise me. All right. Uh... Recommendations. You mess. You mentioned Dave last week. I thought episode two of Dave was just <sighs> like one of the best episodes of, I've, of television I've seen this year so far. He's so good. He was on the town with Matt Bellany talking about how he just Dave was. He seems like yeah. It was a couple weeks oh, I ago. It. I, I think it was I was in Florida and he talked about how he just is supremely confident in his abilities and he just he knew he was going to be a star someday and he's not like a <laughs> over the top like egomaniac but he's just like I knew if I put in the work it was going to happen. And I, I, yeah, it's a very, it's a very smart show. You're right. He is the millennial Larry David. I forgot when we were in Florida. Now it's, I think it was on Peacock. Now Knock at the Cabin. Uh, we watched Knock at the Cabin. That's the M Night Shyamalan one. Probably a better premise than a movie, but I kind of enjoyed it despite the fact that it was a little dark. But I really like movies that make you think like we're gonna put you in a weird scenario and you can have a conversation of like what would you do in that scenario. So I thought it was. I thought the it was, first it was, like. It wasn't like the a, 
the first 85% was like really pretty solid. Yeah, it was, I, 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 yeah, I liked it better than I thought. Yeah, I didn't, they didn't land the plane at the end, but um, if you've seen the movie, they literally didn't land the plane. No spoiler there. Uh, somehow last weekend I got into I got sucked into Father the Bride, which is a movie I have probably haven't my seen wife in twenty five years. My That's wife another one that, that back movie. in the day I would watch that with my mom. That's yeah. the kind of movie that I have I have two daughters. That's the kind of movie that hits differently once you have kids. And I mean, first of all, Steve Martin is just fantastic in that movie. He, there's there's a guy who's been fifty for his whole life, but uh, totally hits differently once you have have kids, especially daughters. And uh, that one that, that kind of got me a little bit at the end a little. I'm not gonna lie, it was a little dusty. I'm, I can admit it. I, I got a little sappy. Uh, that's all I got. Um, I watched the first episode of Barry last night. I, I love that show. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious. I mean, here's the thing. The writers it's are on HBO. It's very dark. The writers are so good that I don't want to, like, fade them. So I'm only one episode in. We'll see. Uh, I, love I watched that the, the first season. two episodes. Okay, how was the second episode? If they didn't have NoHo Hank, there's an amazing scene with NoHo Hank at a Dave and Buster's. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it it really used to be a much lighter show. I think he's obviously doing it on purpose. But after we watched the first episode, my wife just goes, "Man, this show has gotten really dark." I still I still uh, really like it. It's really well done. It's very dark. Um. So I think the the one movie that I've watched more runtime of than any other movie i feel pretty confident in this is casino like it's 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 always on and i always catch 20 minutes of it and i feel like it's just it's it's underappreciated like i know goodfellas is better but i don't think the gap is as big as a lot of people think it is see i always thought i I was always a good fella goodfellas is way up here and casino is a step down that was always my initial read on it but I, I did rewatch Casino a couple of years ago. I'm still a Goodfellas guy. Well, so am I. I, can, I I'm can... just saying, I don't think the gap is that big. Okay. Agree to disagree. We've done a lot of that this episode. Um, and hey, we're, uh, I don't know. I got nothing. At least, we agree, we, at least we agree on Knock at the Cabin. <laughs> <laughs> we got that going for us. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for sticking uh, around. This is a long episode. Um, so if you're still with us, we appreciate you listening. Animal Spirits Pod at gmail.com. We'll see you next time. Oh, wait, wait, before we go, I just want to, I just want to, someone emailed us or someone on YouTube gave a comment saying Michael didn't realize he was middle aged, even though he's bald. His wife complains about his shirt options. <laughs> and what was the other? And he, he, he wants to drive a minivan or something. It was just it was perfect. You, you figuring out you're middle aged. I'm still fighting it. it. I'm still fighting it. All right, see you next week.